So, good afternoon to all of you, and uh, now we will discuss about the uh, next topic, which is uh, about the remote sensing of glaciers. Until now, we have looked into the various aspects of snow and ice uh, and uh, optical characteristics and what makes it possible for us to interpret it on um, satellite images. Uh, it means it's reflectant characteristics we have looked into. It. So now we will look into the glaciers, which is slightly different ball game than just snow and ice. So we will try to explore that. So this picture you have anyway seen that picture which is about the mountain glaciers glaciers generally occurs into the himalaya so we will dwell on this and these pictures and see how it looks like and when you take on this photograph you can see that um, on on this edge region where there are clouds then there is a snow uh, the snow is here and then there's the ice, then this is a rock, uh, and this is a some, some vegetation on that, and this is a ridge line. So you can see, and this is the snow which is stick stick to the uh, to the mountain. So so it is the glacier is a system uh, which contains uh, various landforms or uh, various features which includes snow, which includes ice, which includes debris, and other uh, water. So, and it is a moving, so it is a moving system. So, if you really want to understand glaciers, some of the fundamental understanding of glaciers is very important. That means how glaciers, uh, different zones and different region of glaciers uh, we want to understand so glaciers has fundamentally two major areas or major zone one major zone is, is known as accumulation zone and another major zone which is known as ablation zone so the fundamental difference between the accumulation zone and ablation zone is like say in accumulation zone what really happens is snow which is fallen and either during winter or during summer time it remains there throughout the year and slowly it gets converted into ice so uh, so this is where it accumulates it accumulates the snow and eventually it gets converted into ice ablation zone is a region where this whatever snow is accumulated on top it gets converted ice it moves down the valley and it comes to the lower reaches of glacier and it melts so on the surface of it there is ice which melts so it melts in ablation region therefore it is called ablation zone and it accumulates in accumulation region, therefore it is called accumulation zone. But there are also characteristics within the accumulation zone, which is very important for us to understand. If you go into the very high regions, particularly in Antarctica, or you go into the glaciers such as Sea Chain and other high altitude region, where the temperature is always substantially below the zero degree celsius and because of that whatever snow falls there it doesn't melt and it uh, very little melt or their marginal or no melting takes place on the surface and such zone is known as dry snow zone it means there is no snow but as you move down the valley a certain region of that will start melting and it will melt on the surface but it will percolate something which is a down 
And because of the lower temperature of snow, it refreshes again. And therefore, this becomes a percolation zone. It, what it means is when surface snow is made, that liquid water is passed through certain passage and it refreshes. It doesn't reach up to the ice. Um, it only reaches halfway, one, four, three, four, whatever it is, and it refreshes before it reaches to the ice. So that is known as percolation zone. And if you project it on a horizontal plane, then it's the uh, line which separates between dry zone and percolation zone. This is known as dry zone line. As we move down, into the valley, what will happen is there will be melt on the surface, but this melt now will percolate down, down till the bottom of uh, our snowpack or at the top layer of ice. So what it means, this entire snowpack is now wet. That means there is a liquid water in it. Um, that is during summertime, not necessarily during winter time, and that is known as a wet snow zone. Correct. And then, um, if you move further down the line, what happens is uh, then there is a superimposed ice zones are also there. That means now there is a certain region on. Um, certain region on a glacier when it comes to the line between uh, there's a fern line and there's a superimposed line, uh, ice and so the line separating between the snow line and superimposed line is a snow line and remember at the bottom of superimposed line is known as equilibrium line so if you any one of you uh, who happens to go to glacier and if you go into the accumulation area of glacier, you will realize that there is no superimposed ice in a Himalayan glacier, except you go into the Karakoram region. Most of the glaciers which are related in Pir Panjal mountain range or Great Himalayan mountain ranges or Ladakh Leh mountain ranges, there is no superimposed ice. So what it means is equilibrium line is now same as a snow line. So these two lines merges together. And that is the reason, if you look into the, my very earlier publication, I have suggested that there is no superimposed line zone into the Himalayan glaciers. And predominantly superimposed zone, you can find uh, into the Arctic region and also you can find in Antarctic region as well as some glaciers in Alaskan region you can see and big glacier near us also has a superimposed uh, zone ice zone and we do not have superimposed ice zone so uh, uh, so since there is no superimposed ice the snow line can be considered as equilibrium line into the Himalaya and that is very conceptually important uh, because it makes us possible for us to delineate equilibrium line on satellite images. So there are certain issues related maximum surface pollution previous at the end of these are the terminologies which is required for mass balance purposes and we will look into this mass balance when we go into the further line into the mass balance lecture but remember one thing is there are two zones one is accumulation zone one is ablation zone and ablation zone where ice is exposed on the surface um, and there is also debris on the on the surface and there is a uh, accumulation zone where snow is on exposed on the surface and it gets converted into um, into the ice so, and the satellite images, because of peculiar reflectant characteristic, we can easily delineate the snow line. And uh, under peculiar conditions, snow line can be, uh, or transient snow line can also be considered as equilibrium line. 
So that is the idea behind it. We will look into that. So another uh, way uh, looking at the glacier, if you really want to look into three dimensionally, you can see that that there are different features on the glacier. That means you have, we have already seen there's a zone of accumulation, then there's a zone of ablation. And when it comes to the mass vesting, there's also sublimation which takes place. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have seen mm, what is the sublimation means. That means the solid gets converted into vapor phase straight away. And many of you are aware of that. And then, then there is a calving also takes place and then there is an iceberg. But important question you must see in this is direction of flow of ice. You can see here how, how ice is flowing. You can see this is a region where certain region, the flow of ice is not parallel like this. It is not parallel to the surface, but it is a downward, downward. So it means it has submerging velocity. That means if you go into the accumulation area, component, one of the component of flow, which is in a downward. And if you come into the ablation area, it is emerging velocity. That means the flow direction component of flow direction is upward this is very important for us to understand is the flow of ice is neither parallel to surface neither parallel to the bottom it is it is going downward in accumulation area and it is coming upward into the ablation area and that creates a uh, very different type of landforms. We will discuss that in, a, in a, some other time and maybe later on in this flow. But in addition to that, there's also, you must remember that when, as you move down, uh, so idea is in this is what is at the bottom of, because you have, land on which the glacier is there and it is slowly moving. So, but the interface uh, between the ice and land is always liquid when it comes to the temperate glacier. I don't mean in a cold glacier in Antarctica is a different story. But when it comes to the temperate glacier, like in Himalayas, uh, it is always at zero, uh, it is always liquid water, and that is because of the principle is similar to skates. So when you, when you, uh, Arya, will you stop replying uh, this uh, yes, people's sir, yes. query, query online because it disturbs me all the time. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. because it pops up on my screen and I, I get really disturbed oh, yes. because of that. Yes. So what, what really happens is um, uh, uh, that as skates, uh, 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 as you put uh, moving on the skates, you, you have very small entire body weight. If you can see here, it is on the small area and which is very narrow. So, so there's a significant increase in weight. And because of that pressure, there is a melting point of ice also changes. And because of change in melting point, ice uh, really melts and creating liquid water. That is the reason why many skates you can see here, when they want to get a lot of speed, they try to take such a position and they bring their entire weight on the skates so that they can slide very fast. Likewise, also same thing happens on the glaciers. The, the enormous amount of weight, which is a 300, 400, 500 meter of ice thickness put on the bottom and snow get, ice gets converted at the bottom in liquid. Also because of friction, we will look into some of those slides later on. And you can see here 
how this melting point of ice changes as you increase the pressure. So if you increase the pressure into bars, you can see here that uh, at, the, at the atmospheric level, this is at zero degree Celsius is a, is a, a melting point of ice and melting point is reduces quite significantly as you increase the pressure it can go to minus two minus four minus six so this is very which is known as pressure melting point so you can also go into the in a glacier ice uh, so you can see here that how it changes as you increase the depth then there is a there is a uh, um, pressure, uh, there is a decrease in a uh, temperature. So it is a zero degree Celsius on the surface, and at the 200 meter depth, uh, it is minus 0.15. What really happens then is that as ice start moving, it and the base is rock, there is a friction and because of friction the some energy is generated and it is that energy now cannot dissipate upward because there is no way this reverse temperature traps takes place because energy can flow from minus 0.1 to minus 0.2 but from minus 0.2 to minus 0.1 energy cannot flow and because of that, the reverse temperature traps takes place and whatever energy which is generated at the bottom because of friction, which remains at bottom and it causes the melting of ice. So whenever it comes to the temperate glacier, bottom is always liquid. And because of that, the, the mechanism by which there is also not the sliding, so it is not only due to the creeping or due to internal deformation of ice, there is also component of slide also takes place when the glacier ice moves from um, higher reaches to the lower reaches. So that is the mechanism by which glacier moves, but what are the different features of glaciers we can map? by using satellite images. So these features are glacial boundary, then snow, ice, and debris, reflectance and albedo, uh, glacier terminus and snout, uh, glacier you can measure, glacier advance, retreat, and area loss, supra and pro-glacier water bodies, moraines, you can map the active or inactive moraines, you can see the velocity, and depth, ice, and the glacier mass balance. I will give you a brief idea how to do it. That means the principle of doing it, I will explain to you. None of these issues we will go into depth. Uh, we can, you can ask me questions uh, if you wish. Uh, but same time, there will be some exercise later on which you will do where you will get the hands-on experience of doing this thing. So let us look in terms of how, uh, when you lock, want to map a glacier, it is another map matter how you look from, uh, from a place where you are standing the glacier, and it is another matter when you prepare a map of it. It means you are projecting that in a horizontal plane and trying to look into the glacier map. So this is how ideally glaciers will look like when you, when you want to map the glacier. Uh, what it will look like is you will have, this is a glacier boundary. Uh, you can see a green color glacier boundary. And some of the adjacent area like this will be covered by rock. Correct. And uh, there is a boundary. Uh, uh, between glaciers and rock. Uh, and the sum of the area which will have an adjacent neighboring glacier. So if you go to Chota Shigri Glacier, 
one side is Chota Sheri Glacier and another side is Saraugma Glacier and therefore you call Saraugma Pass or Chota Shigri Pass from whichever way you are coming. So you will have an adjacent glacier. In addition to that, uh, there will be um, in between, there will be a mountain and uh, there will be outcrop. That means there will be a huge uh, land peak which is coming in between. So there is a rock outcrop in between the glaciers. Then there will, and at this point, what will happen is, since they are mountain peaks, uh, they are going to, uh, because of the erosional processes, they are going to dump a lot of debris on it. And as the moving ice, which will take it down, so you will have uh, this debris, which is, uh, you can see debris are coming from this outcrop. And these are nothing but moraines. These are in the middle of glaciers, therefore they are called medial moraines so these are more these are medial moraines which therefore as you move further they will merge with each other and then they will form a debris cover on the glacier um, in addition to that what will happen is uh, then as glaciers are in retreating phase right now there will be a, a lateral extension was much bigger than present glacier. So you can see this is the place present glacier boundary, but there is a lateral extension which is known as on sides. There is a huge reaches which are going parallel or adjacent to that existing glacier boundary, and this is known as moraines, and they are on sides. Therefore, they are called the lateral moraine. In addition to that, if you really look into the land, wherever glacier ends, there will be a small gap. And that gap is known as active versus inactive as some call it Bushen, which is a German word. Uh, but this is active versus inactive ice, you can see there. And uh, this is, and then there will be a, a lake if possible, if there is no lake, then there is a water outcrop. Water, the river will come out of terminus. So, so that is how the glaciers will look like when you want to ma map it on. When you take a photograph of that, you can see very clearly what is map. So you can see here is a, this is a moraine which we were talking earlier. That uh, you can see this is the moraine. And this is the present boundary of the glacier, correct? And so this is going parallel to that, but it is much weaker. Then you are going to have ablation area, which is ice is exposed on the surface. And then there is a lake also here. Then adjacent to that, there will be another glacier and which is generally called the tributary glacier. This is glacier adjacent to that. And I don't, and the certain areas you have a significant amount of snow therefore it is called accumulation area the where the ice is exposed on the surface it is called the ablation area so that is how these glaciers will look like and then you have seen this picture previously and therefore it is important for us to understand that when accumulation area is there there's a huge amount of snow, so it has high albedo. As it gets converted into ice, it has lower albedo, and if there's a debris cover, still it has a lower albedo. So we are in great, great shape as far as reflectance is concerned, and it should be possible for us to differentiate these features on the satellite images. So many times, if glaciers are covered by debris, then it is generally difficult but there are certain clues which you can use if you are using the visual interpretation technique if you are using the uh, digital interpretation it is slightly different ball game so there are may various clues which you can use to interpret so if you have glacier and non-glacier area can be easily marked in fcc if glaciers are not covered by debris so let me see that if glaciers are not covered by debris, 
then you can easily mark. You can see here, this is uh, ice, this is a non-ice. You can easily mark the glacier boundary. So marking glacier boundary did not be a serious issue if there's a substantial difference between the ice and rock is available and glaciers are not covered by debris. That is very important. In August and September season, sometimes grass appears on the lateral and terminal moraine. This gives the red tone on FCC. And that is also possible for you, you to use to delineate the boundary in lower reaches and upper reaches sometimes. There's avalanche accumulation and uh, uh, it is also possible helps you uh, to identify um, uh, certain regions in Appalachian area to mark is uh, so we will look into some of these issues. So you can see here that, but a really tricky issue will remain for you to delineate glacier boundary in accumulation area. Now, uh, since uh, since early 80s and 90s interpretation have changed. Now you can use the 3D, uh, which, is which is available on uh, and various um, Google Maps and other tools, which is available where you can do the 3D and you can get very clearly, you can delineate the glacier boundary, particularly in ac accumulation area, because there are various data are available on internet, you can interpret it, you can generate, you can change its orientation and try and get the correct boundary of glacier. But you can also use in accumulation boundary, depending upon the uh, shadow and mountain reaches also. That was the one idea. Another issue many times comes in how you are going to delineate the uh, terminus of the glacier. That means where glacier ends. There are, uh, if as, as I have shown you in earlier slide, um, if glaciers are small, they are not covered by debris, then you can delineate very well. But many times, glaciers are significantly covered by debris and making it very difficult. Under such circumstances, you can use the origin of stream as a criteria. That means on satellite images, you can use origin of stream as a criteria. You can see here. This is a CHN glacier. You can bond boundary, but you know the glacier is or, stream is originating here. That probably this is the correct position, but this is not the problem with CHN glacier. It is such a huge and such a wall that you can clearly mark, mark the boundary over here uh, very clearly because of the change, significant change in a land uh, in a land feature, which make it possible for to delineate. But definitely, you can see the origin of stream is also one of the clue uh, if you have difficulty in delineating boundary. This is one you can see that origin of stream in Zemu Glacier uh, in uh, Sikkim, you can see sometimes if you are confused, um, if, uh, if there's a, some snow cover, which makes it difficult for you to delineate, you can do it. Or you can also see here uh, some of the um, lateral boundary, you can also delineate by using vegetation as a criteria. You can see here some vegetation, red tone, which is a false color composite, means there's the vegetation there. And this idea also you can use sometime to aid your interpretation and getting correct boundary of, um, of, uh, of a glacier if you are really confused on glacier boundary. Sometimes what happens is there's also lake and because of the presence of lake, it is much easier for you to delineate glacier terminus. And many times, uh, you know, people confuse. They say that uh, it is not possible for us to delineate glacier terminus correctly because of various other regions. But some glaciers you can do it much more better way. And this is one of the Samudra Tapu glacier. You can see, you can clearly mark here it is lake and here it is ice and if you look into the satellite images you can see very clearly that where, where that ice ends and where the water starts and then there are small small icebergs are also you can see here but yes so there are various clues you can use 
to delineate the glacier boundary. But there are also difficulties, many, and sometimes, uh, this is in Gangotri Glacier, you can use the mountain shadow because you know the orientation of Gangotri Glacier is towards the northern side, a little bit northern west. So what really happens is um, uh, during the uh, satellite acquisition time, the, the mountain shadow is created and which is extended further into low-lying area after Gomukh and you can, you can see this mountain shadow. And this you can clearly mark on satellite images and you can see this is a mountain shadow. And this you can delineate to estimate the uh, glacial boundary. Remember one thing, don't get confused between the mountain shadow and water bodies. I can assure you, if you look into the old literature, there are many people who are not familiar with the spectral reflectance characteristics have misinterpreted numerous mountain shadows as a mountain, as, um, as a water body and that was reported and it has, uh, that is one of the reasons why um, some IPCC errors also came. So you should be very careful and um, you, it is easier, much easier for you to delineate separate between mountain shadow and water bodies without any so you, you should be very careful so you can see here river Bhagirati is originating from Gomuk and you can clearly mark and where it ends you can put the snout and you can do that but sometimes delineating of snout is also very very tricky issue because if you are not if you are just traveling uh, into the valley and it is quite possible that you are quite exhausted after taking track for one day, two days, three days, depending upon which glacier you are going. And there is a tendency to identify first major ice cliff as a terminus. And this, is, this can happen to anybody. And then they will say that this glacier is not at all retreating. I will give you two clear examples where such mistakes some people have done. I, it is not fair for me to name them, but, um, but there are mistakes. You can look into the literature and find out that. So this is a picture of Parvati Glacier. So if you are going to the Parvati Glacier and if you are tracking, into the Parvati Glacier, it takes you three days, three to four days from roadhead or uh, wherever. Uh, now there is, a, uh, there is a village from there, you can start taking track. It is a four day track to reach the Mantalai and from there another half a day track to reach the first ice cliff. So this is a huge ice cliff. After four and a half day tracking, you will reach a huge ice cliff and here is a man who is standing here and you can see here how big is the ice cliff is that and you can take it i can assure you many of you will think this is the terminus but reality it is it is very huge it is around um, 60 70 meters it is intimidating ice when you see in front of you you uh, you will feel oh you are very satisfied you finally reach at the terminus of the snow terminus of the glacier but in reality it is not like this reality is something different what it means is that when you are entering into the valley you are coming the first year and this is where first ice cliff whatever that man is standing and wherever we have taken this photograph, you are very much here. And the terminus is a way back over here. This is where terminus is. That what it means, you have to understand the basic definition of glacier. It means terminus is a end of glacier and glacier means the moving mass of ice. So now you come into this huge ice cliff which is not moving. It is just completely detached from main glacier body. And it is a huge, and that is known as dead ice mount. And it is a dead ice zone. 
that means this i zone is not at all moving it remains wherever it is and with the period of time slowly slowly it will melt and it will vanish but the difficulty for you is if you go into the ground and taken the position of this uh, this ice cliff as a terminus you can go year after year five years 10 years 15 years and say that this terminus is not moving glacier is stagnant and glacier is in healthy condition so you can be misleaded your interpretation can be erroneous and you can really create a confusion uh, into the scientific community but terminus is somewhere else that is very important for us you to understand that it is not necessary that you can create a clear interpretation even if you are on ground unless you get the synoptic coverage of the area and the synoptic coverage of the area will only come if you take satellite images aerial photographs and whatever other means you want to do it and understand where is the terminal another place where we are we are really confused is also you know in a chota uh, in a this is a patio glacier another glacier so you if you are moving from um, manali towards the uh, towards the lay then there is a patio which is observatory sase is there and uh, after that there is a jinjinba which is the place you from jinjinba there is a after jinjinba there is a one nala and you go look at the backward upward in that nala there is a terminal there is a glacier and which is currently called as a, as a patio glacier if you move into the valley first thing you will come across so this huge um, uh, ice cliff and there is the origin of steam so you can very well think that this is a terminus but the reality terminus is way way back this is where terminus you can clearly see this terminus since you can see from Actually, from um, from a, uh, if you are in bottom of this valley, if you are here, you will not able to see this. But if you come back, you realize no, no, terminus somewhere else. So uh, this is a much small glacier, and it is possible to see it, see it very quickly. And big glaciers like a Parvati glacier, you will not able to see it. See, it. so therefore, it is important for you to interpret. Uh, even your field observation in conjunction with the satellite images to get you correct picture of what is really there into the ground so this is very important for you to understand and you can see here on satellite images this is a patio glacier now whatever you can see here this is a terminal this is a, a glacier and you can see here uh, very clearly this is a, a patio glacier on that on satellite images so this is very important for us to understand another key issue which comes into the estimation of glacial retreat and if you look into the literature many people will give you even if they have on ground they will give you different estimates of retreat that is essentially because either there is a carelessness or there is a lack of understanding how to measure distance in the field so i tell you uh, and uh, what really happens is uh, suppose you have gone into the ground and identify the control point and you say you identify the point it is another matter whether that point itself is the moving or not but presume that point is not at all moving and it is a stable point now if you are standing here and if you are measuring now you can measure distance like this you can measure distance like this you can measure distance like this you can you can measure distance like this so if you are in hurry you take one or two reading and then you come back and your job is done mm. so what really happens is it is very difficult for you uh, then then that distances is creates error because you are not measuring you are measuring for one point the distance and that could depending upon the angle of measurements distance could be different you can eventually take a mean which is a different matter therefore but it should be done how it should be done is 
is very different story. Uh, this is one method which is proposed by um, uh, Bhambri as well as Tobias, uh, which is they have done in Gangotri Glacier, and I also agree with this method that that this pro this actually takes out the ambiguity of measurements and it provides the, some standard method of estimation of retreat. So what you do is you first draw the uh, center line of the glacier. Center line is a line which divides glaciers into two equal half. You will look that in detail into the glacier inventory lecture. You divide, so, and parallel to that, you draw this line. So you can see this white line, which is at the interval of 50 meters. And you measure, you have previous position, and you have next position, you find out for each line at the 50 meter interval, how much glaciers have retreated. And if you want to take mean, you take the arithmetic mean of that. So that is how you should do rather than any other method. I can assure you that uh, there will be error and many people in past have given um, this kind of mistakes. And then there is always confusion and controversy. And people will say, we have gone into the field. We have done the measurement. How can you say? Mm, uh, it is not correct, uh, but but uh, remember one thing: unless you are really familiar with the idea of math making and little bit trigonometry, it will be very tough for you to um, give correct figure. And we should be very careful, and uh, you should not make mistakes in doing that. The another key feature of uh, glaciers is moraines. Moraines are normally described, as I was saying, is a rock or debris transported by the glacier. So depending upon location, it can be classified as lateral moraine if they are in side, in medieval moraine if they are in middle, terminal moraine if they are at the end of uh, glaciers, or, or it is also called end moraine in the term. It can be easily identified in glacier due to characteristic linear feature and dark tone because relatively, a rock has lower reflectance than ice. And because of that, you can identify. Remember, there is no moraines on accumulation area because uh, even if there are more, there are moraines in accumulation area, they are covered by seasonal snow cover. So they are not visible on surface. It is only visible on, on, uh, on ablation area. So you can see that uh, this is where uh, moraines is. You can see this is a lateral moraine. And uh, you can see this is a lateral moraine very clearly. And below that, there is ice over here. You can also see this is also a lateral moraine. But remember, there is no, you can see this is also moraine. But there is no ice. Glacier terminus is here. Glacier terminus is here. So this portion, it becomes inactive. That means it is not associated. Um, it is not associated with uh, glacier, current glacier, therefore it is called inactive uh, moraine. So it is idea, and if you take on picture, um, yeah, some of you are complaining that pointer is not visible. We will look into that later on uh, so that um, there is no issue. Arya, can you look it on later on after the talk that why some people are not uh, seeing uh, uh, yes. saying the uh, yeah. pointer. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are also um, lateral moraines. You can see here this picture. Uh, you can see there are lateral moraines. There are medial moraines. You can see medial moraines. Then there are end moraines. Then there are ground moraines because they are on the ground. Uh, just it is creating a bed then terminal more and then there is the outwash plane also because what really happens is in a huge area uh, uh, once a river comes there uh, then if it is a plain area then it is the outwash outwash plane that means you the glaciers uh, streams will really uh, move uh, in a larger area and creating a outwash plane uh, in there so you can see on some pictures of that. This is Glacier Lake, and you can see 
this is outlet for legs and these are terminal morains and these are recessional morains or um, end morains whatever you want to call it uh, you can call it in a different name uh, when it comes to the satellite images you can also see it very clearly so you can see here that uh, when glaciers start retreating it shrinks uh, laterally but lateral shrink is relatively less there is a more shrink from terminal side but lateral shrink is less but still it can shrink and leave behind the mark so you can see here that white tone which you are seeing here is a lateral moraine uh, which is uh, which is caused because of the reducing the size of glacier so you know once upon a time glacier was up to this extent its lateral dimensions is not important but its vertical thickness is very important because it will give you the top position of uh, lateral moraine its altitude and the present glacier altitude will give you idea how much glacier have shrunk by uh, but all this thickness has shrunk over a period of time that you can get it clear cut idea on this so this is a nice out of outwash plain you can see as glacier streams come out it is on flat terrain it creates huge amount of a delta kind thing glacier uh, stream can float from this place to another place uh, and it is outwash place you can see this picture is from iceland another key component last issue couple of slides i would like to talk to you about the debris cover because glaciers are normally covered by debris in ablation area particularly true in himalaya it is not true in alps it is not true in uh, rockies it is not true in alaska or canada it is more predominantly slow in himalayas it can reduce albedo of glacier uh, albedo of glacier ice and increase the melting therefore the extent of debris cover is important for runoff modeling studies and the sphere band can be used for delineation of that so you can see here that a key question is is a reflectance curve you can see here we have already seen this cover reflectance curve very clearly one is very high reflectance of snow in visible band and low reflectance of debris then you have uh, another band sphere band which has a low reflectance of uh, ice and snow and high reflectance of vegetation this characteristic can be used to uh, delineate the debris cover on the on the uh, on the glacier so this is a gangotri glacier you can see here so this is band which is a visible band and this is a sphere band you can see here and if you use as a standard false color composite here you can see this is a first is a standard false color composite and here you can clearly see that gangotri glacier and its ablation area and some of the higher reaches had the snow and which is a accumulation area and you can see here that you cannot separate out where is the ice and where is the debris cover but when we flip instead of uh, you change one of the band blue on a green um, a red and a near infrared band which is used in a standard one you change one of that particularly near infrared and bring in sphere band then suddenly you can see ice which is exposed on surface gives you blue color and the rock which is exposed on the surface gives you red color uh, so it is possible for you to delineate debris cover but remember one thing moment you change <laughs> sphere band it is not easy for you to delineate where is the glacier and where is the rock essentially because most of them has very close reflectance so when it comes to delineation of boundary it is important for you to use the standard false color composite and whenever you want to delineate the debris you change the band combination and try and do it so this is the trick and this is the idea how you can debris there are many other issues on glaciers on which we will talk in due course of time 
But today uh, we will stop here and I will thank and for next 10, 10 minutes I will take questions.